which uh, will be given by Dr. Steve Gindel on food allergens. So, Dr. Gindel. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about allergens today. Um, as you heard, my name is Steve Gendel, and I am the Food Allergen Coordinator in the Office of Food Additive Safety for SIFSAN, responsible for uh, a lot of the activities that go on in the uh, agency for food allergy. Uh, where I'd like to start today is uh, with an overview. Uh, I'm going to introduce food allergy so you understand the nature of the problem and why it's a public health issue, and then talk about what we're doing to protect uh, allergic consumers. So, food allergy. Food allergy is an immune-mediated intolerance to food in which sensitive individuals produce antibodies that react to specific pr food proteins. It's a major public health issue worldwide. It's estimated to affect up to 6 to 8 percent of children and 1 to 2 percent of adults. In the U.S., it causes approximately 29,000 emergency room visits each year and is the primary cause or the leading cause of uh, emergency room visits for anaphylaxis in the U.S. It's been estimated that it can cause up to 100, between 125 and 150 people to die each year in the U.S. from anaphylactic reactions. An allergic reaction has a variety of different signs and symptoms that can occur that can affect many different organ systems. These include the skin, where you can have itchiness, flushing, hives, swelling, or eczema. The GI tract, where the symptoms can range from nausea and vomiting and abdominal, abdominal pain and diarrhea. The respiratory system, causing chest tightness, runny nose, wheezing, throat closing, and swelling. The vascular system, where the symptoms can range from dizziness, low blood pressure, heart irregularities, and shock. A severe allergic reaction generally can affect multiple organ systems, and when the multiple systems are involved and the symptoms are severe, this leads to what's known as anaphylaxis, and anaphylaxis can cause death. So this is a very serious problem. Food allergy is also is, presents unique regulatory challenges to agencies like the FDA because an allergic response is a response to a food component that is nutritious and desirable for most of the population rather than to a contaminant or an additive that's an external to the food itself. Further, it's problematic because sensitivity and severity of reactions vary widely in the population and it can even vary over time for a single ind individual. And like we heard for celiac disease, no cure exists at this time for food allergy, so lifelong treatment is, and avoidance are necessary. So what do we do to protect allergic consumers? Well, there are actions that the individual can take and actions that the agency can take to prevent sensitive, uh, to protect the sensitive consumer. Individuals need to practice strict avoidance, which means that they and their families become assiduous readers of food labels. Public health agencies need to work with the food industry to assure that food labels declare the presence of all the food allergens that are intended to be present in the food and to work to avoid the presence of unintended allergens in the food, especially unintended allergens which are not declared on the label. The chief tool that FDA has uh, to help with that process is the uh, providing information to consumers through food labeling, and that is the process is defined in the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act that you heard about in the last talk, FALCPA. Uh, FALCPA amended the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to define a term called major food allergen and to establish labeling requirements for these major food allergens. So what is a major food allergen? Well, the major food allergens defined in FALCPA are milk, egg, fish, crustacean shellfish, tree nuts, wheat, peanuts, and soybeans. And further, FALCPA says that foods that are or that contain ingredients derived from one of these major food allergens must declare that allergen on the food label using the name of that food. 
For example, a food that contains ovalbumin must include the word egg on the label. In that way, sensitive consumers can readily identify foods with problematic ingredients. And if you've looked at the list carefully, you notice that several of them are actually food groups. In that case, the name of the specific type or species within that group must be used on the label. So for example, a food containing pecans must say pecan rather than just say tree nut. FOGPA also provides two different formats that can be used to declare the presence of a major food allergen. One is within the ingredient list, and the other is in a contained statement after the ingredient list. In either case, the common name of the food source is used. It's also important to note that if the contained statement format is used, all of the major food allergens that are present in the food must be listed in that statement. Uh, it's also important to remember that all of the other labeling regulations and requirements that you heard about earlier still apply to ingredients and foods, regardless of which format is used, or for that matter, whether any major food allergens are present in a food. Congress, in, in writing the legislation, also recognized that not all ingredients derived from major food allergens present a hazard to sensitive consumers. For example, the proteins in an ingredient might be highly modified or degraded by the process used to produce that ingredient. Therefore, FALCPA included two exemptions to the labeling requirement. One is the explicit exemption that applies to highly refined oils, and the other is an exemption that can be obtained through submission of either a petition or a notification to FDA for evaluation. The standard that was written into the law for an exemption for an ingredient through the petition process is that the ingredient does not cause an allergic response that poses a risk to human health. The standard for obtaining an exemption for an ingredient through the notification process is that the ingredient does not contain allergenic protein. Both standards require that a submitter include scientific evidence showing why the ingredient meets the standard. Information on the petitions and notifications that S FDA has received to date are available online through the agency homepage. And at this point, no exemptions have been approved at this time. Another point that is important to make is that FALCPA does not address advisory labeling, such as use of may contain statements. May contain is different from contains. FDA expects labels using such statements to be truthful and for industry not to use advisory labeling of this type as a substitute for good manufacturing practices. Which brings me to the second arm of our efforts to help protect allergic consumers, which is the preventing of the presence of unintended allergens in foods. So in addition to ensuring that allergens present in food are labeled, it's equally important to ensure that no unintended allergens are present. This is accomplished by using good manufacturing practices. In addition, the recently passed Food Safety Modernization Act identified allergens as one of the hazards that needs to be considered in a hazard analysis. It says that an allergen control plan should be part of the preventive control plan when that's appropriate. The details of what this all means will be addressed in the proposed preventive control rule that should be issued soon and in guidance documents that are being developed to accompany that. So in addition to those, those issues, the question is how does the FDA keep track of what's going on and how bad the problem is or how good the control is? So FDA has two uh, tools that we use to monitor progress in the allergen area. One is to monitor our recalls database, and the other is the reportable food registry database. The reportable food registry is, is um, a system that industry uses to inform FDA about serious problems in foods that are equivalent to class run recalls. So FDA keeps track of allergen labeling issues by analyzing recalls and reports to the reportable food registry. And just to show the nature of the, the situation, what you see here is a breakdown of the causes of reports to the reportable food registry that we saw during the first year of the registry's existence. And this is just a rough um, overview of the situation. And the important thing is to see that the uh, this 
segment here represents all the reports related to salmonella contamination, and this segment represents all of the reports related to undeclared allergens. And as you can see, the undeclared allergens represent reports almost as frequently as salmonella. It's the second leading cause of reports and recalls for FDA-regulated products. So this indicates that there are some problems that still remain, and we are using the data from these databases to do root cause analysis so that we can find ways to help reduce issues in the future. That's all I have to say, so thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gen Dr. Gendo. We have several questions, and I will tell you did respond to the, the first question had to do with the statements may contain um, on food allergens, and so you explained that one. So I'm going to move to the next question. Um, the next question is, if almost all products may uh, contain soy, how should this be labeled on products without soy in the ingredient statement? Any product which contains an ingredient, which is a, a food which contains soy or contains an ingredient derived from soy, which has soy protein in it, needs to declare that soy unless it's obtained an exemption through the petitioner notification process, except for highly refined soy oil, which is exempt through FALPA directly. All right, the next question is we have, this is going to have to be our last question because we're going to go to a 10-minute break following this. Uh, the next question is, are partially hydrogenated oils used in processing considered highly refined, quote, unquote? We have not yet formally defined what highly refined is or what that term means. Uh, it has... It is difficult because different kinds of oils are processed at different levels depending upon their uses. Uh, and this, if there's specific questions about a particular product, we encourage you to contact uh, myself or others in FDA and get a, a specific information on your product. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have a 10-minute break and we'll resume uh, promptly at 1 p.m. <laughs>